U današnjem vlogu razgovaram sa ekspertom gospodinom Davidom Ogom koji nam dolazi iz Engleske. David Og je direktor Checkmark treninga i već 20 godina se bavi kako sertifikacijama, tako treninzima i implementacijom u oblasti održivih izvora nabavke i ovoga puta ekskluzivno za Addicted to Food razgovarat ćemo o značaju RSPO sertifikacije, odnosno sertifikacije održivih izvora nabavke za palminu ulje, palminu mast. Razgovarat ćemo o značaju imanja oznake ili trademarka RSPO, šta to znači za prehrambenu industriju, za proizvođače, a šta to znači i za nas kupce koji kupujemo ovakvu vrstu proizvoda. Hello David and welcome to Addicted to Food blog. I really appreciate you for responding to my request and uh, I'm really glad that you are here since we meet in 2020 on your really really marvelous training for RSPO lead auditors and uh, I must say that till the end of 2020 I had a successful audit for the RSPO, which is really great to uh, have this in, in uh, or to be the auditor in this region because RSPO is really developing here. And this is the main reason why I called you because I know that you are a real expert in this area and I wanted to talk with you in this Addicted to Food blog just to uh, let some information for the uh, producers about RSPO, what is that and uh, what are the requirements for the RSPO. So I really thank you for responding to my request. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure and I congratulate you on becoming certified. And my input is very small compared to your efforts because um, yeah, I, I like to help people. That's the, the thing people don't really understand about me. I like to pass on my knowledge. I like to help people. And I prepare documents and spreadsheets to help you to demonstrate compliance with the standards. So congratulations to you on becoming certified. Well done. Yeah, David, thank you very much because I've really uh, talked to, uh, with a lot of people. I've really talked with uh, lots of producers and uh, really recommended the trainings that uh, you have a checkmark training uh, because this is really uh an easy way of understanding what is a RSPO and also an easy way to talk with uh, such an expert like you are where you have like 20 years or more than 20 years of experience in this area and uh, when you have experience it is easy to explain to us who are entering in this let's say RSPO world uh, uh what could be the non-conformities, how to deal with them, what could be some, some uh, problematic issues in implementing the RSPO, and, and this is really great. So maybe just for the uh, beginning of this uh, vlog and our conversation, it would be really nice that from your point of view, you just uh, start with the uh, explaining to us what is the uh, RSPO, how it was developed, and what's the meaning of uh, having the certification of palm oil or palm grease. Okay, well, there's a lot of ignorance about oil palm and the palm oil products because people talk about palm oil. Well, palm oil is just one of the many, many products that are derived from the oil palm plantation. So I start off by really encouraging you to talk about oil palm products because from the oil palm, which is a, it's a palm, it's not a tree, it's an agricultural crop that happens to look like a tree but it's a palm in the same way that coconuts are palms and we have um date palms and everything else even the palms in the corner of your 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 sitting room it's a palm it's an agricultural crop that produces a crop from which we can yield two major products called crude palm oil and palm kernel oil so initially we have two two products cpo and pko and from these we get many fractions and derivatives to talk about palm oil is very, very misleading. We must talk about oil palm products. That, that's the first thing. Now, oil palm has been developed over the very much of the 20th century in Asia. It originates in Africa, but the large plantations in Malaysia, Indonesia, because that's the right growing conditions and the labor forces. We need to be growing between 10 degrees north and south of the equator. It needs a lot of rainfall, a lot of water, and a minimum temperature of 18 degrees centigrade to be able to grow. So Indonesia, Malaysia and the equatorial belt going through um, Central Africa, Ivory Coast, um, Ghana, Guyana 
and right the way through to Latin America from Mexico, all the way down through Honduras and Panama and Guatemala, all those Central African, Central American countries, and down into Brazil, um, Colombia, Ecuador. It's a very, very important crop. First of all, to produce it, it's a food product. This is the most important thing. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about oil palm because it's grown so quickly in the, or the area of oil palm has grown so quickly in Asia. And people are very critical about the effect on the environment, the effect on livelihoods. And I'm afraid there's an awful lot of ignorance about the growing of oil palm as well. And notice I'm saying the growing of oil palm, not palm oil, because it's yeah. oil palm, which is where we're getting the crude palm oil from. So the RSPO was set up in, in the early um, 2000 to create a way that we know about the Forest Stewardship Council and the program for endorsement of forest certification systems. Certification is incredibly simple, but it's made complicated by people that do not understand it and those that have a vested interest in making it complicated. What we're looking at is having a set of principles against which we can conduct an audit. And those principles are broken down into criteria and indicators. And the first P and C's that the RSPO had, had eight principles, 55 criteria and about 135 indicators. And these cover social, environmental and economic um, imperatives. And the oil palm growers were, do, were required to demonstrate compliance against these imperatives. And the people that do the audits are the certification bodies. And they have to be accredited. They have to demonstrate that they are capable of conducting audits and making a certification decision. And then we had the, so the CBs evolved, shall we say, for RSPO in the 2005, 2006, 2007. And we had the, fir the first audits done against the standard itself in 2008. It was finally endorsed in 2006. And it took us two years as auditors to understand the standard, to do pre-audits and to understand the oil palm itself. I think it's worth saying at this point that I really took my time to understand oil palm. Um, I'm a forester. I started my forestry career in 1975. And you're now learning that I do give very long answers to very short questions. So be warned. <laughs> um, but I do. I, I went out to Malaysia in 2006 to see oil palm for the first time. My immediate reaction was this is a crop that looks like a, a tree, but it's, a, it's actually a palm. I could understand the agronomy because we're talking about yields per hectare, soils, fertilizers, herbicides, labor, et cetera, et cetera. I could understand the palm oil mill. We're talking about extraction rates, um, again, energy use, et cetera, et cetera. So I very quickly understood, understood the whole agronomy and the social environmental issues because I'm a practical working forester. I didn't need to have any more training by anybody else. I learned myself. So I led the world's first audit that resulted in the first certificate of RSPO principles and criteria in um, August 2008, United Plantations in Malaysia. I then went on to lead the audits, the first audits in Indonesia um, and various countries around the world like Ivory Coast and, and Guatemala, Honduras and so on. So I have a lot of firsts behind my name. But the important thing about RSPO is able to demonstrate that the oil palm is being grown with due respect for the environment, social imperatives, and it's been grown on, a, uh, on an economic basis. Um, yeah, I remember the situation when we started here. I worked for the big retailer company that uh, arrived in Serbia in 2011. And uh, when they arrived, we started talking about the uh, certification of supply chains. And uh, we started to talking about the situation with, uh, at that time, I think it was with the KitKat product. Uh, Kit Kat, you know, the, 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 uh, Indeed, the candy, yeah, the chocolate. And there were some issues where the, uh, uh, they imposed on Nestle to stop uh, buying this uh, oil palm from, from uh, uh, sources that are cutting these uh, palms and destroying the, the living area for the, uh, some uh, type of apes. And then they had yeah. some anti-commercial uh, on the KitKat where you can see the uh, the, the guy is opening the KitKat uh, candy bar and he's eating the fingers of, of the chimp and uh, the bloody and everything and it was a really 
And I think it influenced a lot of uh, money lost in sales for the Nestle, also some sto stoppages in the production of this product, etc. And this was the, let's say, the, the, the first introduction for oil palm uh, uh, and oil palm products actually uh, for, for myself. But uh, from this point of view of 2011, we till, till now, and this is almost 10 years, uh, or 10 years, we didn't talk a lot about RSPO, about certification requirements, etc. All that we knew at that time, or let's say from 2012, 13, uh, was that retailers will ask from their uh, suppliers to be certified according to, to these products. On our market, we could sell some of the products on the shelf where you have the trademark on the product, where you see the RSPO, etc. But the understanding of what this means, what is uh, this trademark on the product is really uh let's say on a really low low understanding and and awareness about about this so this okay. is something let, that, that yeah let, let, let's continue with the the story shall we um, yeah. because that was a very very good interruption there um now let's think about the actual growing of the old palm and the 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 social environmental situation around this it has led to things like the, the, the that very um disturbing kit kat um work that another organization did um, think of the old palm plantations there are only about 20 million hectares of old palm on the entire planet now the we have a huge reliance on vegetable oils in our food industry and you, you know more about the quantities than i do but if we look at the oil palm plantations we can be getting about eight tons of crude palm oil per hectare per year now you compare that to other vegetable oils and you'll see that we need a lot less area to produce a lot more oil mm -hmm. and crude palm oil and palm kernel oil and their derivatives are used in virtually every product that we we can think about it is such a, a versatile oil now if you come back to the oil palm plantations 20 million hectares roughly okay the united kingdom is 21 million hectares in round figures so the area of oil palm is relatively small on a global basis but it attracts a huge amount of uh, attention Take Indonesia, it's got 190 million hectares of land. Okay, it's a, a large archipelago, archipelago <laughs> a lot of, lot of islands. Um, and, um, but there's 190 million hectares of land in Indonesia, and they've got about 7.5 million hectares of oil palm. They have vast areas of natural reserve, um, conservation areas and, and natural forests which are, are, are preserved. And the unfortunate history of this is there's been an awful lot of illegal logging carried out in countries around the world, particularly in, in, in Indonesia. And we're seeing the oil palm companies move in after the logging has taken place. So they're having a, a reputation that they're doing the logging. Well, yes, there are cases where this is happening, and I'm not going to defend the industry to the nth degree, but the majority of the oil palm companies are moving in after the logging has taken place. They have to go through a very um, lengthy process to obtain permission to grow the oil palm. Then let's look at the actual oil palm itself. We're growing about 150 palms per hectare. It, it, it requires a very high labor force. If you look at the agricultural land in Latin America, and we need to talk, think about the actual um, environmental and growing conditions of these countries and not compare them to the vast corn areas of, of, of plains of America, we're looking at about 250 hectares of agricultural land for one worker in these, these poorer countries. You convert that to oil palm and immediately the number of workers goes up to one worker per seven, sorry, um, one worker per seven hectares. So you can do the math that we're using a, a yeah. lot more labor is being used on these plantations. We're also creating a much more in, um, stable environment because the amount of herbicides that are being used in, for example, rice or other agricultural production is far greater than when we use the, the land for oil palm. It's an agricultural crop, for goodness sake. So we're, we're producing far more oil from less land, using more labor, and improving the livelihoods of these very, very poor people. Now, in, a, in, Latin, in, sorry, in Indonesia, if they can earn $2 a day or catch two fish, they can survive. Now, could you live on $2 a day? 
Could, would you live in a house that's got no no sanitation at all, no running water? You're sleeping on a wooden floor. That your bathroom is a river. Your your wife is doing all the washing in a in a running stream. Would you put up with those situations? The oil palm companies come in. They build houses. They want the employ they, they want their workers to work for them. So they provide housing with electricity, running water, sanitation. They build schools. They build hospitals. And they look after their workers. So it's a win-win situation. And we need to ensure. So, so what I'm saying, first of all, is oil palm is good for all those reasons. But RSCO certified oil palm is better because the companies are then demonstrating that they are managing the oil palm against the international standard. They're held to account by the auditors, by the NGOs, and by the public at large. You can look at reports, you can make criticism, and you can really raise complaints against the oil palm companies. So we want the oil palm plantations to be RSPO certified for all the right reasons. And now the crucial thing comes to persuading the people who are using the products to use certified products. Now we have, we talked about the different trademarks. When an oil palm plantation is 100% certified and the palm oil mill, which is producing the crude palm oil and the palm kernels is 100% certified, and the oil palm products all the way through the supply chain can be traced back to, to the, the, a list of mills, we can, sh we can say that all the palm in the product is 100% certified, and we can use the RSPO trademark with a tag certified. So the certified tag shows that all the oil palm in the product is indeed certified. And that's the one we want people to use. And the two supply chain models for that, one is called identity preserved. Now this is a very, very high level of traceability and highly unlikely to, to reach the final consumer. But identity preserved means that the palm in the product, now just to clarify, I'm using the word palm to describe all the oil palm derivatives, fractions, oleochemicals, yeah. everything. I, I can't say the whole lot every time. IP means that the palm in the product is traceable back to one unique mill. Now, refineries buy, um, buy IP products from different mills and they mix the IP together in one tank. So when they're buying identity preserved oil from more than one mill, we have to downgrade it to what is called segregated. And this is 100% palm. And so all the fractions and derivatives coming from that refinery are going to be 100% RSPO certified. That's the one we want people to use. So when we when we see the, the trademark with the tag certified, we know that the palm in the product is 100% certified. The next supply chain model is called mass balance and that the trademark will have the tag mixed. Now mass mm -hmm. balance means that we're transferring the claim on a, on a, on a, um, a certified product to a non-certified product. So there is no guarantee of even one molecule of certified palm in a product that carries a mass balance claim. We're purely transferring the claim to a non-certified product. Um, it is a, it's, there's so many ways of creating a mass balance claim. So what we're looking at is three types of claim. Identity preserved claim that the palm in the product has come from one mill. Ident a segregated claim that all the palm is 100% certified, and a mass balance claim that we are supporting the production of certified sustainable palm oil, but we are using a product that purely carries a claim that is not yeah. even one molecule of certified palm in that product that has come to the mass balance supply chain model. So this and, is, this and is very interesting, David. So sorry to interrupt, because when you look from the side of the let's say the producer in the chain who is using the uh, oil palm or oil palm products in the as an ingredient or from this uh, point of view of the consumer when you look at the train trademark of the final product you have sg or you have the uh, mass balance uh or mixed let's say it like that and when you have the mass balance as you explained it could be that there is no let's say less than two molecules of the certified uh, oil palm. So from this point of view, we can say, okay, but then, you know, this is not certified. We have an issue with that. But on the other hand, 
the producer who is certifying is paying for the certification. So this money is also going to the RSPO and the, it is going to the uh, cause of the uh, uh, certification of these supply chains and everything. So the, uh, on the other hand, you have the support of the uh, this type of certification and uh, uh, responsible yeah, uh, using of oil palm. Yeah, let, let, let's go back one step. Um, how can we persuade people to use certified products? Now, there's absolutely no point in, in, in persuading you or I, the general public, to go out and only buy products that contain certified sustainable palm oil. Because to be quite blunt with you, we don't care. We, the general public, only buy products because of the right price and the right quality. And we, we, if it happens to be RSPO certified, well, I know, and I'm very happy to see the trademark on the product. And being a person I am, I then look at the trademark, I make sure it's being used in the correct way, but that, that's incidental. No, the most important people we need to reach are the people that put the product on the shelf that the consumers are going to buy. The, pro the manufacturers are the final consumer product. We need to persuade them and get them to understand the importance and the benefits of using certified oil palm products. The benefits to the indigenous peoples of the of these very very poor countries. Now, at this moment in time, the, there, if all the oil palm plantations which are certified are producing all their oil as certified and selling it as certified, and it was all being taken up by the refineries, we would have about about 15 million tons of palm oil entering the supply chain. Globally, there's about 75 million tons produced. So 15 million tons out of 75 million tons could be entering the supply chain certified. The reality is there's, only, there's less than 4 million tons actually entering the supply chain as IPSG, um, the, these two very important supply chain models. So it's a tiny proportion of the global production which is actually entering the supply chain as certified so when we come to the refinery they are going to be fractioning down the crude palm oil into for example odin and stearin if they want to be if they want to sell all the stearin as sg they need to buy 100 percent of the cpo as sg and then only 20 percent 20 percent goes on as sg what happens to the other 80 percent so we're seeing a, we don't actually know what's happening beyond the refinery in terms of the quantities reaching the final producer. And the RSPO is very keen to try and push the certified product through the supply chain. So in other words, increasing the quantities into the refinery then pushing it into the audio chemical companies, pushing it into the um, compound product manufacturers and pushing it to the final consumer. No, I'm sorry, we need to do it the other way around. We need to go to the end, end manufacturer and say, look, if you can use certified sustainable palm oil in your product, you are demonstrating corporate and social responsibility. You are supporting all these very, very poor people improving their livelihoods across the globe. You are ensuring that your palm oil, sorry, the oil palm products are indeed from certified sources. And so you can say, I have corporate and social responsibility. And you can put on your website, we are using socially, environmentally responsible oil palm products. And the, you are, they are making the choice on our behalf of the consumers. And we will be very happy as consumers that we now know that that trademark on the product is being used to demonstrate and to communicate to the general public that the oil palm product is indeed RSPO certified. So please, let's reach the end product manufacturer to use certified sustainable oil palm products. And that will generate the demand back from the manufacturer to the compound manufacturers. Um, and these are the semi-finished product manufacturers. And then we go back to the audio chemical companies, we go back to the refineries, and we kick back the demand to the mills. So let's persuade the final product manufacturers the huge benefits of using certified sustainable products. That's my message. Yeah. So actually, this is the uh, original situation in this region of, of uh, Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, also Bulgaria, and, and this area is the, that we do not have the refineries, mainly we don't have it, we don't have the uh, mills, 
but we have the producers like confectionery industry, bakery industry, uh, lots of industries that are using the all palm, all palm products. Uh, so uh, this is the main, let's say, uh, industries that will use in the future or will uh, think about the using of uh, or certification of the RSPO. Uh, the question here is, what are the main requirements? Let's say we are some producer of confectionery products. We want to certify RSPO. What would be the first steps in what we need to do and uh, how to implement these uh, requirements uh, of the RSPO? Okay, the first requirement is to say we are going to be using certified sustainable oil palm products. That's, there must be a commitment from the, the, the whole company and of the senior management and the shareholders that we are going to use certified sustainable products and really commit and make a target of using segregated uh, RSPO products. You can, may have to start off with the mass balance products, but the aim must be the segregated because we know that segregation is 100% certified oil palm products and mass balance is purely um, making a claim on non-certified products. So we want to encourage you to go for the SG um, as quickly as you possibly can. So first of all, a commitment from the most senior people in the company. The second one is to become a member of the RSPO, of course, and then to really understand the, the whole of the supply chain. Once you understand the supply chain and the benefits of certification, it makes it much easier to, to sell the concept inside the company and then onto your onto shareholders and onto the general public as well. So understanding the origins, the benefits to the, to the producers, and then understand the differences between the identity preserved, the segregation and the mass balance supply chain models. Once you've decided you're gonna go for, for example, mass balance and SG, certainly training is essential. Um, now, I'm not here to promote myself, but I, I do like to pride myself with my knowledge and the the training I can give is to really understand everything I've talked about and to then understand what you need to put in place. Now, RSPO certification is in fact incredibly simple. All you're doing is you're buying, you're processing, you are selling. So you buy a quantity of oil palm product. And at this stage, we need to start to distinguish between oil palm product, which is 100%, and a product that contains oil palm. Okay. So okay. we have many products which are 100% oil palm derived. So in the refinery, we have the, we have the Oli, the Styrian, the double frac, the mid fracs from both crude palm oil and palm kernel oil. Then we have the oleochemicals and the main feedstock for, for oleochemicals is going to be the palm kernel oil. So we have the fatty acids, the fatty, ac fatty alcohols, and then we go into the, the, the different seed chains, the oleic acid, the stearic acid, the palmitic acid, and then we go into the secondary oleo derivatives. Um, oh goodness me, there are hundreds of the betaines, yeah. the um, soda oil sulfate. I could go on for ages talking about them. So there are hundreds of oil palm products. Then we have the products that contain oil palm products. So we have the compound products. So we can be mixing the oil palm with non-oil palm, so sugars and fats and everything else to produce the the, the, the mixtures that manufacturers make the final products. So we need to understand that we have oil palm products, then we have products that contain the oil palm. So if the oil palm is certified, for example, SG, and the product contains SG, oil palm product, that whole product can now carry an SG claim on it. So let's say we have 100 tons of product, we break it down and we got say five tons of that hundred tons is oil palm derived. If that five tons has come through the SG supply chain model, all 100 tons then goes forward as SG. It's as simple as that. So what we're looking to do is we're buying in these compound products. In your situation, you're looking towards the end of the production line. You're buying in a compound product, SG. You're then mixing it with other products in the factory and you're producing an output product which contains the SG input product. 
but therefore your output products are all SG. So certification is purely showing the quantity you purchased in, the quantity you mixed it with, and the quantity you made a claim on as an output product. And could you have made the quantity you're making a claim on from the inputs? It's as simple as that. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's made a lot more complicated by people that don't understand it. And indeed, the standard itself is overcomplicated. Yeah. And my yeah, work so. is to make the standards simple for you. Yeah, of course. And uh, when you look at the requirements, for example, because I'm a uh, food auditor, food safety auditor, I always compare it with the requirements of the uh, food safety standards, for example, FSSC or IFS, etc., which are let's say much, much more complicated because you have to think about lots of other, other aspects about hazards, etc. In this uh, RSPO requirements, you can see that uh, main thing is, as you explained, let's say traceability. Well, you have the amounts that have arrived, you have some reception control where you have to think about what you have received to, to check, uh, is it uh, from the uh, approved supplier, etc. Then you have to think about storaging, uh, identification during the storaging of these uh, products. Also, the using in the production. If you have only SG, for example, but if you have some additional like mass balance, then you have to clearly separate this in your records, in your documentation. And at the end of the process, you really have to think: what are you packing? which trademark is on the final product, etc. So when you realize that only this requirement is there, that you have some several records following this and the training of employees to also understand this, it is not so uh, really complicated. As you said, people make it complicated sometimes, you know. And uh, I, I agree entirely. You've actually, um, you described the situation very well. And that, that what you're describing is what you're doing anyway. You are yes. buying from approved buyers, okay? Yes. You are storing your products and identifying them. You're, if you're buying Olean SG, the so Olean has come through the segregated supply chain model, an Olean that hasn't come through the, the Olean is conventional, you've got two separate products, Olean SG and Olean. What's the problem? You're recording them, you're giving them barcodes or whatever. And certainly production manufacturers now are so professional. We don't need to trace the the palm in a final product back to an input product. Okay, that, that needs to be understood. We don't need to trace it back. We purely need to show that the claim was possible, yeah. the input quantities and the output quantities. And the simplest way of doing this is to make sure that all the input products are, for example, segregated. So if all the input products are segregated, all your oil palm inputs are segregated, and any product that contains oil palm has come through the segregated supply chain model, all your outputs can carry an SG claim on. So what's the, what's the problem in between? The people that need training are the people that buy the product, the people that sell the product, and the person that receives the product into the factory. Between those, the beginning and the end, no further training is required because all SG coming in, all SG going out. When you start having different supply chain models like the mass balance and, and SG, and also conventional, then you need a lot more training. And in the same way that you train your, your company to, to identify products coming in and storing them separately uh, and so on. So it's just a natural progression and it's really not complicated. And I've designed a document called my Internal Compliance Manual. So I give it the full title, Internal Audit and Compliance Manual. And I've turned all the wording around of the SCC standard into where, what, when, how, why, who. Because in all my experience of auditing, which goes back 20, 25 years, I am amazed at how few people in preparing their documents and how few auditors use these six key questions. Where, what, when, how, why, who? Where are we going to buy the product from? How do we check that they're RSPO certified? Who's going to do the check? When are we going to do the check? So what I've done is I've reorganized the whole standard into a much more logical sequence of events. I've done one manual for IP, another one for SG, another one for MB. So where do, we, where do we buy the product from? How do we verify that they are certified? How do we store it? How do we do our mass balance calculations? How do we calculate the quantities being sold? Who does this, et cetera, et cetera. So all my documents are designed to simplify the whole process for everybody 
that wishes to demonstrate compliance with the SEC standard. And I'm sorry to say it, but it has been overcomplicated. Um, we also have a, a, another way of creating a claim. Sorry, we need to be we need to be very clear on what is a claim and what is communication. A claim is IP, SG, and MB. So when we see the IP, SG, and MB on any sales or purchase invoice, the company is making a claim this product has come through the identity preserved, segregated, or mass balance supply chain models. When we see the trademark, we are the manufacturer is communicating to the general public about the oil palm product inside that particular product. So if you see the, the trademark on, on cookies with the word certified, we know that the palm in the product is 100% certified. If we see the tag mixed, we know it's come through the mass balance supply chain model, and there's no guarantee of even one molecule of certified palm in that product, but the manufacturer is supporting the production of. There is another, there's another two tags, just to confuse the whole situation. One is called credits. This means that the final product manufacturer does not need to be RSPO certified. They only need to be a member of the RSPO. And if all their oil palm products coming into the factory are non-certified, they can calculate the quantity of oil palm product that they are using. Um, so they're using, let's keep it simple, 100 tons of steering in their product. And they wish to make um, a communication and use the trademark on that product. They could buy 100 credits from the beginning of the supply chain, and they can use the trademark with the tag credits on that on that product. So what they're doing there is using identical trademark as you use for identity preserved segregation and mass balance. You're adding the tag credits, and that purely means that the the manufacturer is buying the right to use the trademark on their product. And the oil palm in that product could have come from the most irresponsible oil palm plantation on the planet. Yet they can still use the RSPO trademark? For goodness sake. So they can use that trademark when, uh, with the tag credits when less than 50% of the palm in the product is certified. So it could be 0% or it could be up to 50%. Now, if, mo if more than 50% of the palm in the product is, um, is is certified so we've got ip sg and mb and they wish to use the 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 trademark on the on 100 of that product they can use that what's called the 50 percent mixed trademark mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they buy the credits to cover the non-certified palm and then they can use the tag with 50 percent mixed so now we've got four potential uses of the trademark we have the trademark with the tag certified which shows that all the palm in the product is 100% certified. We have the trademark with a tag mixed, which show that the, the, the palm in the product has come to the mass balance supply chain model. And whilst there's no guarantee of even one molecule of certified palm in the product, the, the sustainability data has been moved from certified product to non-certified product, and therefore they're supporting the, the production of certified sustainable palm oil. Then we have the 50% mixed trademark, where the more than 50% of the palm in the product is IP, SG, or MB, therefore it's MB, and less than 50% is then covered by the purchase of these things called credits. And then we have the tag credits, which means that all the palm in the product is covered by the purchase of credits from the beginning of the supply chain, and, there, and the palm in the product may have come from the most irresponsible sources. So yeah. th this is what I really want to see the the, the credits abolished today. I've been saying this for a year. I want to see it abolished by midday today. I want to see mass balance phased out by the end of this year. I was saying that in December last year. I want to see it phased out by the end of this year, 2021. We need to be concentrating on IP and SG, and really we're coming down to SG, because IP is a very, very short um, supply chain. So let's see people in the supply chain going for MB, but also putting into place SG at the same time. And then they can move from MB to SG in a very, very quick way. And my documents and manuals help you to achieve that. Yes, David. And also 
one of the requirements in the RSPO is that you have a clear procedure, how you will use the trademark, how you will use it in your communication or the claims on your uh, product. And you really need to be clear on that. Uh, but uh, regarding the uh, requirements, I must say from the cooperation with the retailers in the region, they will ask from their suppliers to have the certified uh, SG. So th this will be the requirements for the private label, private brand product. Uh, okay. So th there is a, this requirement already set up and uh, for the producer who has the already mass balance, they, there are requirements till the end of 2021 to be SG. So this is something following what, what you were saying. Some additional requirements in the RSPO that I want to mention that are similar to the food safety standards are uh, that you have to perform the management review uh, where you have to include also these points, where you have to perform also the internal audit, this is similar thing, where you have to have the document management and uh, the, the time for archiving the documents, etc. Uh, also the training, training plan for your employees uh, and some procedures regarding the production, especially the cleaning in between the productions if you have the different types of, uh, of uh, use like SG or mass balance together, etc. So these are some additional or the requirements of the RSPO that are not so uh, complicated. If you already have some food safety standard, then, then it is pretty much easy for you as the producer to just implement these additional requirements uh, or the explanation of how you will handle these types of products in your production. And, and that's it. When you perform the internal audit, you will perform the internal audit, including the requirements of the RSPO. I agree with you 100%. And I say to auditors, never expect to go to a company and to see a manual saying RSPO SCC compliance manual. You're never going to see that because these are going to be things which are added onto existing procedures. So you're so right. You're probably already doing it. You don't realize you're doing it. And you can very quickly adapt or add to your existing procedures to demonstrate compliance. Um, I'm calling for simplification of the whole standard, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, it's reviewed every five years. Uh, it's very sad to note that the the last review that took place in 2019, 2020, and resulted in the new, in the new standard in um, February 2020, which now has to be implemented by everybody from the 1st of February 2021. The review was carried out by a... Um, a panel of about 27 people and that on that panel there was not one single associate member of the RSPO. In other words, the people reviewing it were not represented by the small manufacturers. The, there were, I think there were four or five growers. What's gro what do the growers have to do with the supply chain? We had the main bulk were the um, were large oil palm producers, Wilmar, IOI and another company. So there was not one single representative of the people that you are representing um, and, and we wanted to talk to now. So the whole supply chain standard has been over complicated and we can make it so simple and so more accessible. And then if we want to build in more traceability and to understand where the old palm products have come from in the final product manufacturing stage, let's that, let, let's that evolve. Let's get the demand for the final product manufacturer now for SG. Send back the demand for SG to the oleochemical companies. Send back demand to the refineries and back to the oil palm plantations. Let's stimulate the whole supply chain by simplifying the standard, simplifying the requirements, recognizing that you are already probably in compliance to a very large extent already, and make it so much easier for everybody. That's all I ask. And, and my trading and my documents are designed to make it simple for you. But I'm one small voice fighting against uh, many, <laughs> many people. <laughs> but, you know, from the training, you also convinced me. So I, this was the, the, the biggest reason why, additional reason why I wanted to call you in the Addicted to Food blog. And this is, let's say, what you said, the uh, 
for the for the conclusion and ending of this uh, conversation of ours. And uh, I must say, uh, of course, when I uh, promote this uh, this uh, video on the YouTube, I will uh, give it also a link to Checkmark Trainings because I really want to uh, empower people to uh, go to that training, to uh, listen to you, to have your materials, which really helped us. I must say that in really short time, I had the information needed to really go to, to help the company implement it and also to uh, help it with the audit and everything. So uh, it was really a, a new uh, challenge for me, but it was really easy because you are there and really helpful in, in everything. Even though we had additional conversations in, in something that, is one, that was not clear and you are available for the people to contact you, to speak with them. And, and this is really uh, something that is, uh, that is uh, powerful for me. Well, I, I appreciate it, Vladimir. I, I get inquiries every day from companies across the globe. This morning, they're coming in from Asia. This afternoon, they're coming from, from Americas. And I can very quickly respond, answer short questions. I do bespoke training. Um, so I, I opportunity for companies to, to rest particular dates and the same as certification bodies and their auditors. I'm not tying you to a date for a course. I say, please tell me what you want. Tell me what, when, when it's suitable for you. And I'll try and fit it in. So I give bespoke training for one hour, five hours, two days. I don't care and we, we can help people to become certified and therefore really develop the supply chain, reinforce the message, and we want to get the message out to the final product manufacturers. So I, I welcome this opportunity, Vladimir. And I'm sorry if I spoke a little bit too fast, um, but this is my enthusiasm for the subject. I really want to make <laughs> it happen for people. So thank you very much okay, for your time. David. Thank you once again, and I wish you healthy 2021. And uh, I wish you uh, lots of success and uh, hopefully we will have one more conversation till the end of the year just to see how it's all developing. So thank you once again and uh, have a nice day. My pleasure. Thank you.